Folks, let's have a warm welcome for Marco Vangelisi. Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here with you, and I appreciate uh, your taking the time to be here in such a beautiful day and talk about investing in finance. So what I'm going to do uh, today is tell you my personal journey from conventional finance to slow money, or what I call regenerative finance. And uh, a couple of key points that I would like to make is that business, usual, business as usual investing is no longer a viable option for us as a species. So this, we're talking about something really big here. And I know I'm going to be taking you through some hard information to take in. And so at any point, I would encourage you to take a nice, take a nice breath and let it out. I'm not going to leave you there for too long, but I have to share some information that is a little bit hard to take. Uh, and then I'll talk about how I align my values with my investments 100%. And uh, the four new trends that will be reshaping the world of investing. It, this is very exciting stuff. And finally, we'll look at local investing tools and current models. And this maybe can lead into something more. And as I mentioned to the organizers, this will be the first part of a day-long um, workshop on local investing that maybe the community can entertain uh, in the future. So let me start and then I'll have a special mission for you because obviously you know you want to be the hero of the story and make things happen. So here's my personal journey from conventional finance to regenerative finance and I'll start with a chart and everybody says never start your talk with a chart. <laughs> and here is a chart. And I'm not going to explain it all, but let me just say it is an efficient frontier, and it's an iconic construct of conventional finance that rests on the premise that all you need to know to make an investment decision is what is the expected return, what is the risk, and what is the liquidity of the investment. Liquidity means how fast can you turn that into cash. And the understanding is that the higher the return, the better. The lower the risk, the better. And the higher the liquidity, the better. And that's all you need to know to make investment decisions. And if you talk to your financial advisor, he'll probably talk about the risk, the return, the liquidity of your investment portfolio. This is what I call the narrow lens of conventional finance. And the funny thing is that when I stumbled upon this chart, I had just spent six years studying theoretical mathematics. So by the time I got to this chart, I thought, wow, we're getting into the real world stuff. <laughs> now it turns out that the real world looks more like this. <laughs> right? And when you're thinking about a tree, it looks like an isolated entity, but you cannot understand a tree unless you think of it as deeply embedded in a very dense network of relationships. The tree is in a relationship with the soil. In fact, by shedding root filaments, it builds the soil from the ground up. It is in fact related to mycelia and to mushrooms and to fungi in the soil, you know, the so-called mycorrhizal relationship. It is related uh, to the carbon cycle. It takes carbon out of the air and converts that into uh, oxygen. So it's breathing with us, if you want. It's a complement of our own breathing. Not to mention the fact that the tree is the habitat for many, many species, um, both of animal and other plants. And yet, when you're looking at this tree through the lens of conventional finance, that's all you see, right? I mean. From the perspective of finance, a tree is just worth the commodity value of the lumber you can extract from it. Another way of saying this, which is kind of interesting, is that according to conventional finance, a tree is worth more dead than alive. Because the only way to quantify the lumber is to cut the tree and cut it in pieces. And it is this type of thinking, this reductive thinking, that comes with conventional finance that leads us to 
transforming places that look like this into places that look like this. And this is a little bit hard to take in. And again, take a deep breath and let it out. This is painful on various levels. On one level, you could say, what a waste. I mean, whatever economic benefit was derived from this operation, it could not possibly um, you know, capture the true value of a forest. Or you can think about the injustice. This was a common, this was a, uh, something that was built by nature over thousands of years, is an active and working ecosystem that provides ecosystem services to the current generation of humans and future generations, but not only humans, also animals and other species. And yet, this common was at, at one point privatized, and the owners of this property derived an economic benefit from destroying it. Or on a more deeper level, you can feel that a part of you has actually expired with this forest as well. And so it was this type of transformation that got me to leave the finance industry. As I mentioned in the past, I was working for a very well-respected investment management firm. I was part of the um, emerging markets equity team, so we were investing in emerging markets. And we were managing money primarily for endowments and foundations, including environmental foundations. And we were doing great. This was actually a company, unlike a lot of the Wall Street firms, that was very ethically and professionally managed, was doing the right thing for the clients, and so on. But um, when I looked at, we were, by the way, the best um, mutual fund uh, investing in emerging markets with a 10-year track record. And this particular year, uh, we had a spectacular return and all our clients were so happy. And then I said, well, you know, how do we get, how did we, uh, did we get that return? So I looked a little bit more closely at the top performing stock in the portfolio. And that was a palm oil company in Malaysia that had just destroyed tens of thousands of acres of rainforest and planted this monocrop of palm oil plants. By the way, part of the profits were derived uh, from the carbon credits it claimed for having planted trees. Forget about the fact that it destroyed uh, a working ecosystem that had been around for thousands of years. And so I remember um, talking to the one of our clients was an, a large environmental foundation that had given us money and was very happy with us because we were returning very nice returns to them. And I said, are you not concerned that the money of your foundation is invested through us in a company that has just destroyed tens of thousands of acres of habitat for the orangutan? <coughs> and that your foundation was built and started to protect those types of habitat. So there was a little bit of a moment of silence there, a little uh, awkward moment. And I think I could have gotten fired for asking that question. But uh, at the end of the day, he said, look, I am on the investment side of the foundation. Foundations have two silos, two groups staffed by people that have different culture, different languages, different backgrounds. And one half is trying to protect and grow the assets of the foundation, and the other one is giving away the 5% every year to maintain the tax exam status of the foundation. And so the guy was in charge of the investment side and said, look, my job is to protect and grow the assets of the foundation in perpetuity. And I thought, hmm, interesting. We grant that pool of asset a luxury that we do not afford to the thousand-year-old rainforest. Right, because those assets have to be maintained in perpetuity, yet the forest does not have that privilege. And he basically said, uh, I'm just trying to you know, generate enough return to pay for the programs of the foundation, including trying to save the rainforest. <laughs> and so it was at that point that I realized you know, the cognitive dissonance between what I really believed in, I've been a, a nature lover, and I've been a passionate uh, supporter of environmental foundations, and here I am participating in this strange game where even well-intentioned, ethically motivated people have the incentive to do something that on an aggregate level is really self-destructive, I think, in, in the end. And so I had to leave 
my job. I couldn't really continue doing that. That was 2009, and I guarantee you that it's very hard to leave a, va a very high paid job in the middle of an economic recession, especially because public speaking is nowhere near as lucrative as you might think. <laughs> but anyhow, I had to do it. And this, you know, I, I thought the, the line by Upton Sinclair that said, it's very hard to make a man understand something if his understanding is required for his keeping his job or something like that, right? But once you understand that, you say, okay, wh how do I, you know, square my beliefs with my livelihood, what, what I'm doing? So this launched me into this essential knowledge for transition, understanding these large systems and understanding that, you know, the systems are, de are designed to provide certain incentives. So I'm not uh, so interested in demonizing individuals, you know, within the system because it's very hard to step outside of it. But it is the system itself that needs to be understood and changed. So one thing that uh, I already explained to you a little bit in the first part, how many of you attended my talk on money and banking? So yeah, the, the majority of you. Um, the first thing you need to understand is that money is a construct. And money is created through an expansion of balance sheet of commercial banks. That's really how money is created. So it's an accounting operation that simply expands the balance sheet of the banks. They accept the promise of the borrower to repay. They create the electronic money uh, for that borrower. And that is also the money that ends up invested. The investment capital is at the end of the day, finds its origin in that process of an expansion of the balance sheet of s banks when they make loans. And so it's not as real as we think. And yet, all that investment capital around the world is, you know, looking for returns and looking to grow itself. Even though uh, those, those investments uh, numbers, those in investments dollars and capital is a claim on economic activity and the natural capital at the end of the day. So one can grow with no limits. The other one has some pretty hard limits, which is, you know, we have one planet, one ecosystem, and so on. So I'm trying to make you understand here that when you look at a, at a statement of your investments from your brokers or your financial advisors, those numbers are not as real as you think. So let's look at, first of all, the size of those numbers. Uh, the global GDP a couple of years ago was $70 trillion with a T, okay? So it's a big number. Let's use that as a unit of measure. So one world is $70 trillion, okay? So if you look at the global financial capital, just the liquid capital in bond markets and stock markets around the world a couple of years ago, that was $212 trillion, three times as much as the world. This is called the financial intensity of the world. So how much of the GDP is basically expressed in the financial markets. And this is the highest ratio it has ever been in the history of humanity. That we have, you know, liquid financial capital in the, firms of, in the form of bonds and stock, which is three times the GDP of the world. But we also done something like creating derivatives contracts. You probably heard about interest rate swaps. Uh, uh, collateralized debt obligations, um, um, forward agreements. I mean, there are like a lot of contracts that we created that are just another form of money. In fact, the uh, crash of 2007 was a collapse of the shadow banking system when packaged CDO tranches bought by mutual money market mutual funds were not as worth as people thought. And there was the risk of breaking the buck. I don't know if you remember that story. But in any case, this is really real because what we considered almost like money, our money market mutual fund, where you can write checks and buy things, was actually backed by securities that we had created that were not worth what we thought were worth. And we created a lot of that. Now, the, the estimate currently is that we create about 2,000 trillion worth of nominal derivatives within a year. So those numbers are not uh, you know, quite real, but I want to make it a little bit more direct and personal for you. And again, you have to hang on with me for like five minutes, because I need to share some dark stuff, and then we'll go into the positive, all right?
So big breath, let it out, don't be too worried. Okay, uh, how many of you have heard about the terrifying carbon math? Okay, the people that are like in the divest, invest campaign or 350.org. So the two degrees Celsius is a very important number for us earthlings. And it basically means we cannot raise the global temperature of the planet more than two degrees Celsius from the pre-industrial level. We've already raised it by about 0 0.8 uh, degrees Celsius. Celsius, why? Because at that point, the global ecosystems will start to unravel to the point where they are not likely to be able to support higher forms of life. And we happen to be one of those. So this is a very important number, right? We should pay attention to this. So how do we raise the temperature of the planet? Well, the main way we're doing that is by taking the carbon pools in the ground and putting up in the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels. That releases a lot of CO2 and carbon in the atmosphere. So the question is, how much carbon can we still put in the atmosphere before we breach the two degrees Celsius? Another very important question. We should know. That answer is about 500 gigatons of carbon. Now it sounds like a very large number, but at current emission patterns, we should be there in about 12 to 14 years from now. So it's not that far off. But the most important question is, how much carbon do we have already in the known reserves of fossil fuel companies? And the answer is 2,800 gigatons. I don't think we as earthlings have wrapped our head around these three numbers. Because if we had, we would do a couple of things. This means 80% of the carbon we already know, and it's in the books of the large fossil fuel companies, cannot be burned has to remain stranded in the ground. If we really understood that, we would stop all drilling for oil in the Arctic, in the deep ocean, in you know, fracking, uh, tar sands. We would just stop all of that because we have f four times, five times already too much. So we can burn more than, than a fifth. And again, we can do two things, we can either uh, keep going and burning it, or we stop. If we keep bo going with that, what's going to happen to the capitalization of this large oil companies? So here is, here is the, uh, the point. If you have some investments, like a mutual fund and it's well diversified, an S&P 500 index with Vanguard or something like that, you hold a lot of these companies. These are oil companies. And if you look at the market capitalization, I think the market is not getting it right, as the market was not getting it right in 1999 for the values of the technology companies. Remember when it didn't matter what your earnings were, just the eyeballs, how many eyeballs we are hitting your website, that was the only thing that mattered? Well, the market was not getting it right then. The market is not getting it right now. Because uh, if the market really understood that 80% of the assets of these companies can never be extracted and sold, the capitalization would be probably at least 50 or 60% less than it is right now. Now, if we keep going and we burn all those fossil fuels, then the question is, what do you think is the value of the large six oil companies in a planet that does not support human life? <laughs> My guess is even less than 50% of that. So this is very real in the sense that when we think about all oh, the riskiness of maybe local investing, you also have to think about the really big systemic risk of continuing to invest as we've done so far. Uh, and last bad news, and then I'm, we're going to go on the positive thing, and uh, so stick with me. Uh, there is, and I mentioned this, there was a study done by the UN. They commissioned something, a group called the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity. And this is a group that uh, pursues the idea of environmental economics. And the idea is that, well, the market, we saw last time I spoke, I guess last week, the market does not see everything, does not see externalities, ca cannot price in externalities. Those are, you know, somebody pollutes, somebody else is paying for the pollution, even though they were not part of that original transaction. And so 
uh, some economists have said, okay, if we just measure in financial terms what those externalities are, and we feed that price signal to the market, then it's gonna work. So, I mean, I have some reservations about that, but it's already a first good step. So this large scale study looked at basically 99% of the economic activity in the world and came up with a dollar value for some of the externalities. And they call that the unpriced natural capital. So they looked at water use. Again, if you remember from last, from last week, nature does not charge us for the water, for the rain and so on. Is that amazing? Well, we still use it and maybe pollute it. So uh, what if we attach a value to that, to the land use, to waste, to land and air pollution and greenhouse gas emission? What would happen? Well, then they looked at something called the, um, so this is kind of the schematic of it, but they looked at something called the um, region sectors. And again, this is small numbers, I'm gonna blow up one of these lines, but here is the gist of it. They look at economic activity of a particular kind in a particular region, that's called the region sector. So for example, coal power generation in Eastern Asia, right, you see that region sector, the sector is coal power generation, this, uh, the region is Eastern Asia, or land use, cattle ranching and farming in South America. And they said, how profitable would the sector be if it had to pay for the cost of using unpriced natural capital? And what you see here, and I'm gonna blow up the second line because it's the most egregious one, it says, the cost of natural capital was $312 billion, and the revenues, not the profits, the revenues of that sector is $16.6 .6 mostly selling cows and cattle to McDonald's, Burger King, and the big chains. And the high cost has to do with the fact that they're deforesting, you know, taking down the forest, uh, turning that into pasture, eroding the soil, and so on. So this is really an egregious situation, right? But, uh, because it, we, you're not paying for this, so you're destroying $312 billion worth of natural capital to get just a revenue of 16.6. So what they found at the end of the day is that the top 20 impact region sectors used $3.2 trillion of natural capital to generate $2.4 trillion of revenues, not of profits, right? So if you think about that, we're kind of using nature as a business in liquidation. We're liquidating the natural assets on which our survival depends, and we call that economic activity and financial returns. None of them, none of the sectors would have been profitable if they accounted for the use of natural capital, and overall the top thousand region sectors, which is really 99% of the whole um, economic activity worldwide used unpriced natural capital worth $7.3 trillion. So you have to think in, in uh, relative terms. The GDP, I pointed out, uh, this, this is a number for 2009. The GDP number I gave you is 2012. That was $70 trillion worth of GDP. Okay, more than 10% of that GDP is subsidized with the destruction of the natural system, ecosystems. So when we're talking about GDP growth, I mean, m more than the growth is the subsidy that we receive from nature. When we're thinking about the $212 trillion worth of investment capital that are trying to get a return, a lot of that return is subsidized by nature. And that's what we need to keep in mind. So we are basically in this situation, and now I'm taking you out of this dark space, but you know, uh, imagine the situation of the guy with a tattered business suit there, talking to the children around a little fire, saying, yes, the planet got destroyed, granted. But for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders, <laughs> right? So uh, it is at this point that I want you to uh, meet this lovely creature called a tardigrade. How many of you know about the tardigrade? They're like little cute uh, creatures that are about a millimeter long. NASA is going gaga about these little guys uh, because they're probably the most resilient animals of that size in the world. They can be completely dried up like a speck of dust and be in a dried state for like decades. 
and then you grab them, you put them in water, and after 15 minutes, they, you know, uh, blow up and start moving again. It's amazing. And while they are all dried up, you can bombard them with radiation that are 2,500 times the radiation that will kill us, humans. And when they are alive, they've been found alive and happy at temperatures between minus uh, 50 degrees Fahrenheit and plus 200 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm saying this because if you happen to be a tardigrade, then your investment portfolio, especially your retirement portfolio, is perfectly positioned <laughs> to create the conditions in which you will be very comfortable in retirement. <laughs> but if you're not a tardigrade, you really have to pay attention because what happens is, and if there's one thing that you need to take away from my talk is this, that the investments we make today are not happening on a separate planet and just the financial returns are repatriated to us. They are shaping the world we're living in right now. So I would like to invite you to do something because I don't want to talk to you for like an hour and a half without interruptions. So I have some pieces of paper. I don't know if you guys have a little bit of uh, a pen, maybe one or two uh, of you. And I would invite you to, as last time, create little groups where you can answer the following question. What are the things you don't want to support with your investments? So what are the things that you care about, whether that is, you know, prisons or pollution or whatever? Just go through that exercise and say, what are the things that I would rather not support with my investments? I'll give you five minutes, work on that, just list out the things that you would rather not support with your investments. And then we'll move on from there. So if you need some paper, I have it here. And uh, I would, um, I know there's like so much fun, it's gonna be very hard to get you back on the talk. So when you hear this noise like please wrap up your conversation and come back. So that would be what you don't want your investments to support. Okay. All right, let's come back. How was that? Was that fun? All right, let's come back. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was the fastest most of you had returned. So I appreciate that. Um, so when I realized I was not a tardigrade, I uh, changed my entire portfolio. So what I realized is that uh, um, we are driven in our investment decisions by these three concepts, right? Return, liquidity, and risk. They're very important concepts. But there are two underlying psychological factors behind those. And the first one is, let's face it, greed. And you know, we're, we're all a little bit greedy. I don't know if you're like uh, kids that, you know, they have their toy, they don't want to share them, or, you know, they get two beautiful strawberries, maybe they want to eat them both and not share. You know, it's, it's like it's, it's part, it's, it's a natural thing, right? So there is a little bit of greed in, in, in us, but there are also something else. And the other one is fear. So if you think about the return, getting a high return is the greedy part. Uh, the risk is like the fear. <gasps> we don't want to lose any money. And the liquidity is right in between. Like if things get squirrely, you want to get out of it and go into something that is really more uh, attractive. And so my question for me, first of all, what I did is I liquidated my, all my savings. And I just sell the heck out of them. Because I said, you know, I don't know what they're doing. You know, there is like, if the portfolio I was managing with this, this team of people, we were not really aware of what was going on. I mean, there was a, a quantitative process, it was a computer and a model we built. So it was like a quant strategy, right? Uh, but if we had no incentive to look more deeply into the, the, uh, the various securities that we were holding, 
uh, it was impossible for me to find out what else I was funding with my investment. So I sold everything. It was actually quite easy. You know, sell, 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 done, because it's all liquid. It's, that took no time. But then the question is, how do we do what, what I do now with, with the, my uh, savings? And so I thought, what if I direct my investments based on two different psychological motivators? What if I start with biophilia, which is the law, the innate love we all have for the things that are alive, and empathy? What would happen? to the portfolio. So that's what I do now. And what I've been doing uh, since I um, you know, left Wall Street in more than one way, right? both with my job and with all my investments, there's nothing that I own that is in the stock market. You know, just It's all, at this point, direct investing in businesses I believe in. And so of course I look at return and uh, liquidity and risk, but that's a secondary consideration. I start with, is my investment reflecting my love for everything that is alive and the natural ecosystems. And um, is this investment solving a social problem or a social need? And only after that would I look at return liquidity and risk. And so I'll give you some examples, and I'm not you know, recommending any of this, but just to give you an idea of how some of the investments I made relate to biophilia and empathy. So Farmland LP is a company in San Francisco, actually, that buys conventional farmland and converts it into organic land. And it leases the land in a rotation uh, manner to operators that can operate at scale, whether those are ranchers or farmers, but they just move around so that they do kind of the multi-species rotation system that you know, Joel Salatin um, is practicing in, uh, in the South. Um, so that has to do with biophilia. You know, both the animals are very happy on, on the land there, and uh, the soil is getting more and more fertile every year, and eventually gets converted into organic. And uh, by the way, it's also the best way to store carbon in the soil. So when you talk about carbon sequestration, using the plants as pumps that take CO2 and put it down on the ground is the best way. Uh, now, in between empathy and uh, biophilia is this beautiful farm up in Portland. Uh, in Oregon, a friend of mine uh, created this uh, Our Table Cooperative. It's a beautiful piece of land. It's about 80 acres. And it's run as a biodynamic farm. And it's run as a multi-stakeholder cooperative where the farm workers are also the owners of the business, so are the consumers of the uh, goodies provided, you know, produced at the farm. And also they have a shop on the uh, property itself that uh, features other um, goods produced by local Oregon producers, and those producers also are members of the cooperative. And so you have both a beautiful farm managed in the right way and a collectively run an organized farm that is a multi-stakeholder farm. And finally, on the more on the empathy and solidarity side is a people's community market. And uh, I'm actually on the board. And for the last 10 years, West Oakland has not had a full service grocery. And there are a lot of problems with that, including obesity and so on. And so Brahma Mahdi, who has been involved in this project for now, you know, 20 years, has even gone back to get an MBA to be able to start a grocery there, uh, is trying to build the first uh, full-scale, full-service grocery store in a food desert uh, in the middle of plenty, you know, in the Bay Area. So those are just an example. Um, the interesting thing is that there are four trends that are going to make those investments easier and more accessible to everybody. And the four trends that I think are, are going to revolutionize investing in the next 10 years are uh, at the intersection of four, um, again, there's four trends. The first one is the social enterprise movement. A lot of young people coming out of college now do not want to be working for a large corporation you know, operating in the extractive economy. They want to try to solve either social or environmental issues using the tool of a for-profit 
entity, but it's an entity that does not have to maximize profits, just to be profitable to support itself, but the real goal is to solve an environmental or social problem. So social enterprise movement is really spreading. Um, that's why, you know, by the way, I read an article on, um, I think it was a Time magazine, poo-pooing the millennials. And the, the key argument there was, oh, 50, uh, you know, 30 years ago, if you asked people that this age, uh, in this age range, how many of them wanted to be a CEO of a corporation, you would say like 40% wanted to be a CEO. Now the millennial only 12. I see that as a sign of sanity. <laughs> because you know, to be a CEO of a large multinational corporation, I mean, you probably have to, um, I don't know, have a certain way of um, separating your personal values from what you're doing out there in the world. You know? And I think the millennials are not willing to do that. And so I think that's, that's very helpful. Um, the other one is impact investing, which is basically the recognition that we need to go beyond risk return and liquidity and look at what the investments are actually doing out there. So that's, uh, that's the, the impact investing world. The other one is the laws and rules are changing. Uh, a lot of the uh, laws regulating the financial capital and raising capital um, have been introduced in the 30s after the financial crisis of 1929 because there were a lot of scammers out there. And so the SEC was created in 1933 to protect, you know, old ladies and people that did not have the sophistication to understand what those uh, snake oil sellers were selling them. And basically said, if you are a business and you're trying to raise money from regular folks, you have to register your security with the SEC. You know, and then you need to register it in each state in which you're offering your security. You know, so when you do an IPO, like Facebook did or Google and so on, you probably have to spend a couple of million dollars in legal fees to go through that process so that everybody can buy the stock. You, everybody in this room, can buy an Apple stock uh, or a Facebook stock or whatever because they went through the process of registering their security. What happens is that a lot of the small businesses in our community cannot afford that. And so, you know, either uh, they approach very wealthy individuals called accredited investors that the SEC says, okay, if you're rich enough, you know, you probably know how to deal with this. We don't need to protect you. You can invest in whatever you want, right? But otherwise, there are a lot of restrictions. So the Jobs Act passed in, um, by the way, Jobs stands for Jump Starting Our Business Startups which was very clever, and nobody could vote against jobs, you know. <laughs> uh, and so they voted, and they basically the Title III would allow for some registration uh, exemptions that would make it easier for people to offer their security generally to the public. Now, the SEC has not yet ruled on the rules, even though they were supposed to get that done by the end of 2012. They're still working on it, and they're kind of a little bit scared and afraid that this will open up the floodgate uh, to, you know, that we get back to the old problems of everybody trying to use that and maybe take advantage of people. But anyhow, and the other exciting thing is some states now are jumping ahead and passing their own crowdfunding laws. Uh, there are about uh, 30 states now in the United States that have done that ahead of the SEC. And so uh, using the so-called intrastate exemption, the SEC says if you're planning, if your business is only in a state, you're selling mostly to the state, you're offering the security just within the state, deal with your state. You know, we don't need, you don't need to register with the SEC, just deal with the state. And so that is a little bit simpler, but uh, uh, so using this uh, registration exemption, some states are actually making it easier for um, people to raise capital from their community. And finally, you know, the local first movement that says, you know, we want to support local jobs, we want to buy local, we want to shop local, buy local food. The last step of that is we want to invest local and keep the dollars in our community. And the, and, uh, the intersection of these four trends, there is really the possibility of building sustainable communities where our capital is aligned with what we're trying to do and it's kept circulating in the local economy. So, before we go to the next one, I want to do you to do the same exercise, but now on the positive side. What are the things that you really would like to support with your investments? 
What are the things you would like to create out there in the world? What are the things that you are passionate about and you would like your investment to help bring them to life? So I'll give you another five minutes, maybe with the same group, and now on the flip side, or if you need a little bit more, I have some more paper, do that, and, and then we'll figure out how to do it. All right? <laughs> Let's wrap it up. All right. Thank you. How was that? Was that fun? A little bit more fun than the first one? Yes? Okay. So first of all, I want to say I have a mailing list here. Uh, so if you left your name on the main mailing list there, it's not mine. So, but if you're interested in uh, keeping up, I usually send out once a month an announcement, some resources, articles, and things like that. So that's my um, mailing list uh, if you want to sign it. And uh, um, I have an assignment for you, which is now you have written down what you would like not to support with your investments. So maybe an exercise is find out if your investments are supporting those things or not, right? I mean, it's like if we're saying we don't want to, uh, I don't know, support the industrial prison complex because we incarcerate too many people, then the question is, are you invested in the uh, Correctional Corporation of America, <laughs> which is a large company that has this private-public partnership with states to run their prison system, including a contract that mandates a 90% occupancy rate of those prisons. Otherwise, the states have to pay a penalty. So what happens is that even though crime has come down in the last 30 years, incarceration has gone up because it's good business. So uh, the, the question, if you have that, for example, find out, are any of your mutual funds containing CCA? The, right? I mean, a lot of you probably don't know. Or if you're saying we don't want to um, support uh, genetic pollution, do you own Monsanto? <laughs> or if you're saying uh, we don't want to increase global warming, do you own some of the oil companies, right? So in other words, look at the list of the things you don't want to support with your uh, investments and try to figure out, and I know it's hard because we live in this intermediated, highly intermediated world you know, of global finance. I, one thing that um, surprised me was this. In 2009, I left my job. It took me three years to divest from the old economy. And yet, the personal financial cost of leaving a high-paid job was much, much higher than the loss of possible returns from you know, liquidating from the big companies and from mutual funds and so on. And so the question is, why was it so hard for me to align my investments with my values, even though it was not as costly as aligning my livelihood with my values? And the answer is that we live in this very intermediated, opaque global financial system where we are giving our money to intermediaries with uh, very clear goals, like this is my money, I would like you to grow it at a particular rate, don't take too much risk, these are my tax constraints and so on, go do it. And they do it, mostly. But you know, it, it's this intermediation that separates us from our agency in the world through those investments. And I remember I was uh, driving a bike and um, uh, someone was driving this very big four-wheel drive and was distracted and almost mowed me down. And so when I said, hey, you know, you should pay attention, she, 
the, the person at the wheel said, uh, I, I didn't do that on purpose. I said, you know, yes, I, I understand that you were not trying to kill me, but if you do, you know, you still go to prison, even though, you know, it was not your intention. It's called manslaughter. So I think maybe we should apply the same <laughs> to our investments. <laughs> when we say, oh, I didn't know I was funding the things that were destroying, you know, destroying the environment. Well, maybe we should pay attention. Maybe we should look and say, well, uh, you know, what are we doing with, uh, with our investments? Now, and the good news is that there are now more and more opportunities for us to um, invest in alignment with our values. And of course, the social responsible investment mutual funds is a first good step, but it's just a for first step. I mean, we really need to move beyond that. And uh, I understand that people say, hey, I don't know how to do that. I didn't study finance, I am a little bit puzzled by this concept. What am I gonna do? I'm afraid of making a mistake. And so those are the things that maybe we can discuss more uh, if you guys are interested in a, in a workshop on how to do this stuff, right? Um, so, but let me talk about the way forward. When I left my, fin uh, my, my job in finance, I thought I would never have anything to do with investments or finance at all. And then I stumbled upon the work of Woody Tash, uh, the founder of Slow Money. He wrote this quite poetic book. Actually, it's probably the most poetic book on finance that you'll find, <laughs> called Inquiries into the Nature of Slow Money, Investing as if Food, Farm, Fertility Mattered. Right? That's kind of an interesting concept. And uh, uh, it was fascinating. So slow money is really a conversation about the fact that our financial system is probably out of control, that our food system is kind of broken, and that one way to address and fix it is to come together as individuals and invest in real places. You know, invest in people and enterprises close to home and starting with food because we understand food and everybody eats food. And the idea is to invest patiently you know, with the goal of building, uh, you know, communities, building ecosystems over the long term. And the idea of measuring success, not just by the profits and the return we create, but also by the world that we create around us. And let me give you um, an example. Our first, our first investments as Slow Money Northern California. There's just a group of people, by the way, Roy here. Uh, is um, kind of leading the uh, slow money group in this part of, of the Bay Area. Our next uh, regional meeting is going to be probably up either in Berkeley or San Francisco on this um, 16th of November. So there are fun meetings with 50 to 100 people like you that you know come together to figure out how do we support food entrepreneurs, farmers, and so on, and uh, create the things we want to see. Uh, and so the, the first uh, investment we made was a poultry farmer in Petaluma. And uh, we made a loan. Basically, we went out there, we, we fell in love with the chickens. <laughs> uh, they were having this beautiful life out there on, on the grass, and uh, the farmer was charming. Anyhow, we fell in love with them, we made a loan. And what they needed the, the money for was uh, put an irrigation system in their property so that they could extend the uh, pasture, you know, the, the foraging of their chickens during the summer, which would get uh, very dry. And so they bought all these PVC pipes and then something happens. Uh, PG&E had an explosion in San Bruno yeah. and killed a bunch of people. And so what they did is they preemptively rented all the trench diggers in a radius of 100 miles so that nobody could rent a trench digger to put down the pipes. Now, how do you factor that in in your competition of risk, right? And so the pipes have been out there in the sun for the whole, uh, you know, first season. They didn't get enough income, you know, during the summer. Then something else happened. Uh, major drought in the center of this country. Uh, spike in the feed for chickens. They didn't believe or want to raise the price of their meat because they felt that that would be only serving the elites. But you know, then you have to pay attention to the margins. And then the third blow, their two teenage daughters went to college. No more free labor on the farm, <laughs> right? So to make a long story short, after a couple of years, they said, sorry. 
you know, we're, the business is, is kaput. We are just throwing the towel. And we said, uh, okay, we understand, you know, but we've kept in contact with the, with the uh, farmer and we're trying to support the farmer as much as possible. So that what they did is they so sold a couple of acres, re-changed a little bit things, they started growing olives and herbs and so on, and after a couple of years later, she started paying us again. And she basically said, you know, I, I committed to this, you guys have been so supporting of us, and we're gonna, you know, I'm gonna honor my, my commitment. And so, you know, she started paying again, and today, today I received the check for the balance of my loan. And so this is an interesting story because on one hand, it shows the risks, right? You're investing, making a loan to a small business, there are risks associated with that. You know, especially if there are, you know, farming operations, you know, startups, not to mention, right, because the startup is always very risky. But it also speaks to the fact that if you know the entrepreneur, the entrepreneurs understand, you know, you, that you're not just this uh, far away financial entity, you know, you're part of the community, there is that bond that eventually, you know, can result in a risk reduction, like in this particular case. So it's, you know, at the beginning it started as a warning story, a uh, cautionary tale, and uh, at the end, you know, it turned out okay, you know, because, because there was this connection. So, um, again, the idea is that, you know, start small, start doing something with something that you can afford possibly to lose, you know, but it's a good start, and then you can practice and, and work on it. So, I'll just give you a couple of ideas of the non-financial benefits of this type of investing. So this is in uh, Slow Money, North Carolina, invested in Chatham Market. This was a well-established co-op grocery store with um, featuring a lot of local producers. There were about 200 food producers and farmers in the neighborhood that basically supplied this um, co-op. And this was also the center of the social life. Like if you want to meet someone in, in town, you would go to Chatham Market, hang around there, uh, sipping your coffee, and eventually that person will show up because everybody was going to the same shop, right? So they had been in operation for a number of years. They got a $400,000 loan from a bank from out of state that they were paying every month. And this loan was coming due in a year. And the bank at that point, you know, after the financial crisis, they were kind of reining in, not extending loans, and say, you know, we probably are not going to extend the loan to you or charge a much higher interest rates for doing that. And so they were really worried, you know, that they couldn't make it. And so um, Carol Pepe Hewitt, who is the um, organizer of the Slow Money Group there in uh, North Carolina, said, okay, why don't we mobilize our community and see if we can refinance this, this loan? And so she put together 16 people, each put in $25,000, created a little LLC. They bought the loan a year before the balloon payment was due from the bank. You know, basically bought the loan, refinanced it at 5%. So they took down the interest rates from 8.75 to 5%. They kept this, you know, center of the social life and this eco local economic engine that was supporting all these local producers uh, alive in their town. And yes, they're going to get 5%. Okay, it's not that much. And they pay 1% for you know, the management of the LLC, so it's 4%. But you, know, you can see the non-financial benefits of doing something like that. And by the way, those interests are going to the community itself. They're not going out of state to a bank that is not spending those dollars in the community. So that's an example. This one is one I participated in, uh, Cape Valley Farm Shop. They basically aggregate the produce of about 35 farms in Cape Valley and do CSA uh, delivery. And so that really helped them along, and it's great to see that they're growing and, and becoming more and more successful. The other one is, this is an interesting innovation called an investment club in Maine, the group decided to form an investment club. Everybody pitched in $5,000, and then they collectively decide how to make the loans to the small businesses. And so they have 20 members, they committed 100,000, and they already made 30 loans, right? So that's another way to do it, you know, do it collectively. What happens is that a lot of the people that participated in the 
uh, in that investment club, then did a number of side deals together, or maybe even the same deal, you know, the small loans that have been made by this investment club, they upped it up on their own, you know. And so that's a, a process of learning how to do that. And it's a little bit akin, uh, you know, the idea of the food system, right? We have this industrial food system that makes it really easy for us to have dinner in five minutes. We just toss it in the microwave and we eat it. We go to, uh, you know, McDonald's fast food. We eat really fast and it's so easy and convenient. But, you know, 60% of the people are now obese. We have to deal with all these other problems. The same, I would argue, is the case for the financial system is that it's so easy for us to give our money to the financial intermediaries, ask them to generate the returns, but the ultimate result is probably a planet that is really in danger. And so, or actually somebody said, uh, we don't need to save the planet, we need to save ourselves. The planet's gonna be fine, it's probably gonna have a lot of tardigrades running around, but, um, you know, so that's, that's the other thing. And um, so here are a couple of ways to do that. So the idea is that how do I do this? And there are some easier way to do that. The first one is move your money. What happened is that, and I mentioned this, the large banks, there are like four banks in the United States that have 50% of the assets in these countries, they do not do lending to small businesses anymore. The majority of lending to small businesses are done by small banks, regional banks, and credit unions. So by transferring your savings and your deposits from the large banks to a local bank, you're expanding the capacity of that local bank to make local loans. So simply by moving your banking from one of the large banks to a regional bank or a credit union, you're expanding the amount of dollars being lent and circulated in your community. That's the easiest thing that everybody can do, okay? Uh, more than a trillion dollar of those deposits have migrated from the big banks to the smaller regional banks since they launched the Move Your Money campaign. Um, you know, RSF Social Investment Fund, Yay. it's a wonderful organization, it's a social finance company that has um, a fund that has $170 million, is a revolving fund, and they lend to, um, in the agricultural space, education, and the arts. And you actually know exactly where your money goes. So you find out, you know, from their newsletters, who is receiving the loans, and it's really wonderful. So um, that there's another company, uh, it, it, the other thing to look at is the CDFIs, the community finance development corporations or, or financial institutions like the Northern California Loan Fund. They are building low income housing and they have a revolving fund. You can invest in them and get one, two, three or four percent depending on how long you leave the money. And the minimum investment is a thousand dollars. These are managed pools where you don't have to worry about, oh, am I making the right decision? Am I picking, you know, the investment that's gonna go belly up? Uh, the Culver Foundation have investment notes. In fact, they're trying to regionalize uh, that. Now they have notes for Denver and for, I think, Twin Cities. They're planning to do that around the country so that we would have funds and notes uh, investing in CDFIs that support our local economy. So these are the examples. Uh, Culver Foundation, Community Loan Fund, RSF. Uh, then there is the community route. And one of the simplest way to do it, and it's kind of, uh, sometimes you don't think of it in that uh, terms, but being part of a CSA, community supported agriculture, is a way of financing local farmers. You subscribe in advance to the produce of the farmer, and so you're anticipating the capital that they need to put the seeds down and to harvest the products and so on. So it's a great way to do that. There are also other prepaying options like Credibles, and I'll talk about that in a couple of slides. Then there is the Slow Money Group. I mean, the Slow Money uh, Network either in, uh, um, in the Bay Area or I guess in Berkeley, San Francisco or here is a group of people that come together and look at opportunities, investment opportunities, and they collectively think and look at that. Um, now, the other idea is Kiva Zip. How many of you know about Kiva Zip? 
So this is an online platform. You probably know about Kiva. Kiva used to be, is like the zero interest loans. You put the money in and then you can select uh, you know, a farmer out in Africa and so on that they can get your loan and they can buy a cow or whatever and then they repay uh, your loan. And you get zero interest, but you are supporting this uh, small micro entrepreneurs around the world. Well, Kiva Zip is the same idea for the United States. And communities can become the trustees. In other words, you could have a UU church in Redwood City becoming a Kiva Zip trustee that, you know, look at maybe some entrepreneurs that are worthy of, of receiving some loans and they can be put up on the platform so that everybody can participate and put in $50 or $100 or, or $10, right? So part of the risk of investing gets mitigated if you're investing very small amounts. And that's where the, um, the uh, platforms and the crowdfunding can really become interesting. So in other words, if you want to support someone, but you know, this is a, a new business, they might fail, they might not work, but you know, the, the community likes what they're doing and they want to support that, then maybe doing a Kiva Zip loan where everybody can put $50 you know, and you have 100 people doing that, now with 5,000, the entrepreneur can be up and running. And if things go well, you, you'll get that money back. So that's the other way of looking at it, is, um, you know, get something happening. Now then there is the personal route. There is, um, let me say one thing, which is for a lot of our retirement savings, we feel we don't really have a lot of options. Uh, if you are a teacher in California, Calsters is managing your money. But we do have some influence. I don't know if you remember when the Sandy Hook, was that the Sandy Hill, Sandy Hook massacre occur? Was that a couple of years ago, Sandy? Sandy Hook, yeah. So what happened at that point was a number of teachers in California realized that their pension fund was invested in a company called the Cerberus uh, Corporation or group, the Cerberus Group, that owned Freedom Industries, which is a weapon manufacturing, uh, that included um, the Bushmaster, that was the, the mm, maker of the gun that was used in, in Sandy Hook. And the teachers didn't like that. They didn't like the fact that their uh, retirement fund was invested in that company. And so the uh, California Teachers Pension Fund made a little call to the Cerberus Group. And they you know, invested $750 million with the Cerberus Group. And they said, we're not happy. Our teachers are not really happy that we are invested with the gun manufacturers that you own. And a day later, the Cerberus Corporation announced the sell of their positions in the freedom industry. So they sold all the weapon manufacturers out of their portfolio. This is a sign that even when we think we don't have the power, we do if we speak up. If we you know, talk to our administrators, to the people that are managing our money, to the people that are uh, managing our pension fund. So I just wanted to mention that. But we can also take the direct route. Um, I had a rollover IRA and I just moved it to a self-directed IRA where I actually direct investments. Um, so for example, the, the investment in the farm that I mentioned was done through my self-directed IRA. So if you have an, an IRA, you can you know, find a custodian that can hold the securities for you and you can direct them. We can talk more about that if you want. But uh, the other one is peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending. There are some platforms like that. I want to show you the DPO, the cutting edge uh, X. I don't know how many of you know, but a number of entrepreneurs use the intrastate exemption to register their security with the state of California. And they can openly offer that to everybody who is in California. And for example, the People's Community Market has a DPO. They raised $1.2 million from the community, 80% of that from the Bay Area. Right? And I'll show you on this website, uh, Cutting Edge X has the list of the DPOs that are available to Californians um, and other people in, in around the country. And so let me do that. So this is the website. If you go to cuttingedgex.com, 
It's a beautiful little one minute video. I mean, I wish I could. Uh, do we have an uh, internet connection here or not? Maybe not. Yeah, okay. So maybe uh, after the talk, I can show you this one minute video that they use to say to entrepreneurs, you know, you don't have to go to uh, people that have, you know, venture capital funds that then force you to grow and sell. And so a lot of the businesses we want to support are not on that high growth path required for venture capital. And so um, this one is an interesting one, is um, uh, the Economic Development Finance Corporation in Mendocino. This is a um, uh, CDFI that did a DPO, so you can invest a minimum of, of 1,000. And they are investing it. The first project is going to be a wool mill project in Mendocino County. And so this is actually managed by uh, somebody else. So it's not that you know, you're investing actually in the CDFI and providing them some funds, and they pay an interest on that. Uh, so I just did that um, last yesterday, in fact. Uh, this one is uh, Farm Fresh to You is one of, in fact, is the largest CSA in the United States with more than 50,000 members. And they are offering uh, green notes. So you can basically uh, buy their notes and you either paid, I think, 2% in interest in cash or twice as much in the form of a box. So your interest could come in the form of your CSA box if you want. And then, you know, you can, I think it's a two year uh, limit and then you can re-up again or not. So that's another way to, you know, invest in your local economy. The other one is Cutting Edge Capital itself is a law firm that is helping entrepreneurs uh, go through the process of DPO. They also had a uh, um, DPO that I invested in. Uh, there are, uh, there's a Hydro Revolution, which is this company that is using solar power to build a desalinization plan in California. Very interesting. Uh, Makers Common is a, a food purveyor of cheese, craft uh, beer, and wine in San Francisco. Uh, Nia House is a um, um, daycare center in the Bay Area. And um, this one is the Sunspeed Enterprises. They're building basically recharging stations for electric cars along the Highway 1. And so that's, they did a DPO and you can participate in that. And uh, People's Community Market, uh, which is this, um, uh, this uh, grocery store. So these are all available to everybody. The minimum investment is usually 1,000. And yes, you, know, you can you know, look at it and maybe we can, uh, if you guys are interested in doing a workshop on local investing, we can actually look at the prospectus and understand what to look for, what are the risk factors and so on. But it's not that impossible to do. I mean, and it's something that we eventually need to do because our money cannot support the things that are destroying us. You know, it's like we, we cannot invest in our own destruction. That's not a good strategy. <laughs> um, so anyhow, there is another one, which is this prepay platform, which is interesting. How many of you know about Credibles? That is basically uh, something that was started by Arno Hesse, who is uh, co-leader of the Northern California chapter here, our network in, uh, uh, of Slow Money. And uh, basically it's a way of prepaying for your favorite food. And you can prepay, usually you get a discount, and then you pay with your face. Because when you show up, people say, oh, you are Marco, okay, fine. You don't need to give me cash, I'll just subtract from your account. So it's, it's a neat feature that keeps track of the back office of all those, you know, it's like those uh, uh, loyalty cards, but then you always lose the card, and you know, the entrepreneur doesn't know how to keep track of them, and then, you know, it's like very complicated. This is all seamlessly integrated in their um, back office. So, Kiva Zip I talked about, uh, community source capital is another platform that's making possible uh, investing in your local community. Um, Fundrise is an interesting one too. I don't know if you know about this platform, uh, Fundrise. is basically you can participate in commercial real estate development and some of them are um, you know, local in California. So that's about it. So your turn for action. All right. What I said in the prior two talks is that we need to make some substantial changes. Some of it requires 
changing the federal law or lobbying with the government and so on, right? I mean, like redesigning the money and banking system, that's a heavy lift. And it's good, <laughs> it's good if we all know about it so that we can put pressure on our representatives when stuff happens, like a 2007, you know, what a waste of a good crisis in that case. <laughs> We could have, you know, nationalized the big banks and broken them in pieces and run them as utilities for the interest of everybody. We missed that opportunity, right? Uh, but let's not miss the next one. But this, in terms of investment, we can do. We control our own funding, and we can do this. So it's within our power. So uh, here is what I would like you to do in the quiet of your mind. I'm not going to embarrass you and actually ask you to share with anybody, but just in the quiet of your mind, Assess your net worth. What are you know all the savings you have? Just think of that number, roughly. It doesn't have to be precise to the dollar and cents. Just you know, roughly. If you're talking about you know five thousand or half a million or something like that, take one percent of that. Right. So if it is half a million, is five thousand dollars. You could probably live without it. Probably. And in fact, here's the funny story. Uh, there was a book called uh, Rich, Richestan. Have you read Richestan? So what it did is they interviewed, it's like this anthropological study of the rich. And they interviewed people that had a net worth between uh, 10 million and 100 million, people that had between 100 million and a billion dollars, and people above a billion dollars. One of the questions they asked them is, how much would you need to feel financially secure? <laughs> <laughs> and the bottom two groups, so from 10 million to a billion dollars, they all said roughly about twice as much as they had. <laughs> and it didn't matter if they have 10 million, for those people 20 million would have been fine, or if they had 800 million, for whom 1.6 billion would have been fine. So. It's all relative, but I would say, you know, if you think about your net worth, you'd probably say, oh, twice as much would be nice. But I think even if you were to give up 1%, it wouldn't be the end of the world. And yet, if we all invested 1% in our local economy, we could transform it. And that's the bottom line. The amount of known financial returns that we could get out of that 1% would be transformative. And you have to keep that in mind. So, I would say, Take the 1% and within the next three, four months, invest it locally. Whether that means, you know, buy, putting the money in RSF social finance, whether it means buying, you know, the DPO of uh, um, the um, ECDF, or whether it's doing a loan to a small business or something. You know, start small, but start doing it. And then you could let me know, just send me an email to investor at ek4t.com. And maybe if we have a group of people that did that, we could do a little celebration. Maybe a dinner uh, a couple months from now, here in this area, just to celebrate our accomplishment. So, questions? Thank you, thank you. Could you please line up here at the microphone with your questions, and uh, we'll have our Q&A session. Thank you, Marco. Marco, I understand um, the importance of identifying where our investments are, but it's complicated. Do you have some tools that you can recommend for helping us actually figure out what those funds are invested in? Uh, well, yes. So most of the funds have a list of um, securities. And in fact, you know, like the S&P, uh, you can go on Wikipedia and just say, you know, who's, who's investing in the S&P. Um, I think there are some uh, companies that are helping rank companies according to various values. So for example, Hip Investors in San Francisco um, has a database where, uh, based on what your criteria are, we'll show you which companies are ranking high and low. There's also a company that I met at SOCAP recently, and they're now in the development stage, but they would like to do that um, for 
everybody so that you could just uh, you know log on to their website and find that information. Um, but the way I resolve that is by selling everything and then starting from scratch. But I, I see your point, and I you know I don't have a good answer for you except you know check Hip Investor. Uh, anybody knows? The hippie Investor. Great. Okay, so that's that's a list. Morning start at least finding out you know what what is included, but uh, that's something that you can find that pr in prospectus. That's the other thing is that nobody reads the prospectus, I know. right? It's like you bu you buy Apple, you buy Apple, n and you're supposed to read this 150 page thing disclosing all the risk, and nobody does. They just buy that. But if you're you know doing any of the local investing, people are gonna read every little page. Anyhow, it's funny how it works. Okay. But thank you. Uh, she said that there is a, in Morningstar, there is a feature where you can enter your mutual funds and they can tell you the individual companies in each of those mutual funds. It's also true that the mutual fund itself in the prospectus will have the list of that. Thank you, Marco. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm Debbie Mitels and I'm part of a group that's working with 350.org, the environmental organization concerned about climate change, and there's of course a divestment group of people that are trying to divest from fossil fuels. They're going to have a workshop, this is an announcement, but I want everybody to hear it, um, on Sunday the 15th at the First Presbyterian Church in Palo Alto at 2.30, and I will send you all a note about it. It will be for people who want to learn how to divest from fossil fuels, and there is a new web site too, and I'm exactly not remembering the name, but it's fossil free fuels or some fossil free investments. But I will send out a note about it. Everybody you know, actually, uh, if what we can do is, if you don't mind, send me that link. I will, to all the people that sign my mailing list, I'm going to send a thank you note with some resources, and maybe I can send, uh, you know, this information about your meeting and other resources you might have. That's great. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And we can do one here at UUFRC too, subsequently, later on in the year. All right. Yeah. Great. Hi, I um, was hoping might, you might have a little bit of guidance for this. So I've had a, the same financial advisor for maybe 25 years or so, mm -hmm. a long-standing relationship. And maybe the past 10 to 12 years, I've been fighting with her on all these different things, bringing up, you know, and she's been, you know, and she's basically saying, look, my job is I need to get this amount of return for you to set you up, you right. know, blah, blah, blah. Here's what you want to do with your life. Here's Right. Your income is, or, you know, blah, blah, blah. and so I can't, I can't, you know, invest in these so because they're not going to get. And then I've, I've gotten her to allow me to, and and sure enough, more times than not, she's right. Those are not returning, or they're losing money uh -huh. compared to the other investments that she right. wants me to do to complete right. you know, what she says I need for a portfolio. Right. So. That, that is the, absolutely you know that to her or should I just pull out of that altogether and go or something that is that is the 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 crack of the matter uh, because I was a fiduciary and she is a fiduciary a fiduciary has a le is legally bound to preserve your capital and make it grow according to uh, level of risks that are suitable to you and so she is bound by law to do what she's doing and but again think about what I was telling you at the very beginning right which is we use 7.3 trillion dollars of natural capital every year for our 60 trillion dollar worth of economic activity and financial returns of course you're gonna get higher financial returns investing in the extractive economy because somebody else is paying for it mostly nature and all of us eventually, <laughs> right? So that is the hard thing, is that a lot of the returns that comes from aligning our investment with our values would not be in financial terms. And yes, you need to be responsible and you know, not squander all your capital and so on. So there is a, a fine balance that we need to, uh, to walk. But what I'm saying is that, well, first of all, I do have a couple of uh, financial advisors that are you know, more attuned to these themes than others, but they're still bound by the same constraints. And so I would say, uh, you know, one possibility would be take a little bit out, maybe 5%, and say with 5%, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play with this, and I'm gonna invest in the things 
that I care about, and the return I will get is mostly non-financial. Although if you are careful, you can also get a small financial return out of it. Um, so that's maybe the way to do it. You won't change her because it, you know, her job and her duty is to uh, provide the return commensurate with the risk you're taking. And a lot of the things that we're doing in the new space is a little bit higher risk, a little bit lower return. The reason is we have returns in other forms. And that the return we get in the usual economy, it's extractive in nature, eventually we're gonna pay for it. Just not quite yet, or not us. Right, so that, that's the, you know, it's, it's such a big topic. Uh, I will also send you, um, if you give me your, your email, my, um, I did an interview with Local Vesting. By the way, there are some other very good books here. Uh, local Dollar, Local Cents. Uh, this is Local Vesting by Amy Cortese. Anyhow, I was interviewed by Amy Cortese, and there is a, a long interview about all these issues that she asked me. You know, what is the return to local investing? You know, what is the risk, and so on. So I can send you the link to that, too, if you're interested. Right, thank, you. thank you, good question. So uh, what I was thinking about through this talk was uh, the requirements put on the, the companies to perform the way they're performing. So like at the beginning you were talking about the, uh, all the uh, carbon and the re known reserves for the oil companies. Okay, those oil companies treat those as assets and they're, they've got a duty by law to uh, turn those assets into revenue that they can pay out to their shareholders. Uh, so, but I was wondering also was, uh, you know, there's, a, there's another kind of business called the Real Estate Investment Trust. Okay, so in that case, the government puts requirements around that company saying, you've got to behave in a certain way and then it gives it certain gra grants of uh, tax-free status or whatever. Uh, okay, so, uh, do you see any any uh, form that a government could create a different kind of classification of a business that could create a different set of constraints around a company to behave in a more positive way? Right, that is an excellent question. And I would say the best thing we can do right now to achieve, at least to allow for the possibility of that happening, is to defeat Trans-Pacific Partnership. The tra it, which is kind of interesting, it seems like uncorrelated, but actually the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, has uh, the so-called Investor State Dispute Resolution System, which has been uh, pioneered by NAFTA Chapter 11, uh, signed by you know, President Bill Clinton, unfortunately, uh, which allows corporation to sue governments for regulation that impinges on their current or future profits. This is actually higher than any uh, jurisdiction within the country. So some uh, companies have used uh, this, um, this uh, investor state uh, uh, dispute resolution system after the Supreme Court of a country ruled against them, like in the case of Philip Morris in Australia, uh, or uh, I think it was Texaco in Ecuador. And what that would basically mean is that countries will not be able to put a carbon tax or, which, which would address the, the, the problem, or say, mandate basically the, that certain amount of carbon will not be extracted. So that's why the TPP, which was finalized as an agreement among trade representatives and corporate representatives in Atlanta, uh, I think a month ago, or even less, and will have to be approved by Congress, need to be defeated. Because uh, we cannot have the government impose those constraints that are a, a diminution of the profits of certain corporations, but also preserving the health and wealth of uh, you know, this generation, future generation, or, or whatever, right? Like for example, saying we need a carbon tax, which would be the way to do it, every country that would start doing that would be sued through the TPP um, using this uh, investor state dispute resolution system, which is an arbitration, uh, an unappealable 
arbitration where there are three lawyers, they're usually corporate lawyers, that gather and basically issue the judgment and then the government will have to pay. Uh, so for example, when Germany decided to phase out uh, the production of nuclear uh, plant, a um, company in Sweden sued them for, I think, $3 billion of lost profits. So again, that's it, what you're saying is, uh, you know, eventually we'll need to have some sort of government regulation. There will be some cost to some corporations for doing that. And if they have a way to come around and then make the government pay for the lost future profits, something like that will not happen. So what you're saying is that the control over the economy is being taken out of the hands of the government and uh, is being put in the hands of the investors, or, or it's already happened. Right, right. So it has happened already in bits and pieces, but I think the Trans-Pacific Partnership is something that we need to pay attention to and ask our congressmen absolutely not to approve it. Yeah. So. Yes, that's actually great. So Benefit Corporation is, uh, first of all, B Corporation is a certification process that says that your company is also paying attention to other things besides mas maximization of profit. We now have a new legal structure in a number of states called the Benefit Corporation, which is similar to the C Corporation, but also says uh, that the, the company is exists is a for-profit company that exists also to address other issues by other stakeholders, including you know, the community or uh, the natural system and so on, so that the shareholders cannot sue the board of directors for decisions that are not profit maximizing when they are taking into consideration these other dimensions. So I would say, um, you know, and I don't have yet a list of publicly traded benefit corporation, but that would be one way to go about it, like select the benefit corporation. Do you have that information? Uh, John Montgomery, who is a lawyer in Menlo Park, who's a shareholder in Benefit Corporation, lost. And uh, he's been suing for a long time. And he's been suing for years. And he lost. John Montgomery, I don't have his contact information. Right. So John Montgomery is dealing with uh, so companies John that are John Montgomery Benefit Corporation, you'll find this information in his email. Right. Right, okay. But there's 2,000 corporations that are benefit corporations, but they're not publicly, publicly traded at this point, yes. Okay, so basically that would be another way. It's like if we invest in, in companies, let's invest in companies that are not bound by just profit maximization decisions and they can take into consideration other things like the environment, communities, workers, and so on. Yes. Marco, thank you for leaving your job when your conscience got to you. You're welcome. I actually think, this may sound odd, but I have compassion for investment advisors who have a fiduciary obligation but are themselves troubled. And I would love to invest in a company. Maybe we could create a B corporation, a B fiduciary <laughs> status <laughs> where our invest, because none of, it's too much to ask every citizen to become a professional right. investor. but. There's all kinds of members of the investment profession who would like an option right. to the current strictures of fiduciary responsibility. They'd like a B corporation option. Right. I'd like to invest in a company that would create a company for those investor professionals right. and give them a way to transition out of a corrosive sy right. system themselves without putting their families on the streets. Right. No, that's, that is a big, uh, that is a big challenge, you know, it's like, uh, in part though, you have to keep in mind that uh, it, it would mean taking a little bit more risk and get a little bit less return, you know, so that in general. And so yeah. uh, the fiduciaries are bound by that, and I know a number of, a couple of them, uh, one is called natural investing, I think. And there are a couple of people that I can put you in contact with that are uh, as attuned as possible to this dilemma as a fiduciary of trying to get their clients to invest in the right things. And also, there's another company, that, uh, it's a, a, a wealth management company in Boston called Clean Asset, Clean Yield. And they are actually really good at doing direct investing in things that are aligned, including slow money type of deals, okay. uh, but one that have, you know, 
uh, they, they are good at understanding the, uh, the level of risk and, and providing still a return, but it's a clean yield, as they say. I'd like to have a resource to recommend to my investment advisor when I talk to this right. person in the coming months. Where should I tell them to st even just start getting better informed because this person would be highly motivated to do that? Right. Uh, you can look at some of my uh, resources on my website. Okay. So I'll send that with the, uh, with the thank you email. So thank you can pass them on to your thank advisor. You. So specifically, we could do an incubator for green technologies, which are also in B Corporation approach. And um, by investing a relatively small amount in such an incubator, you're in an inside view monitoring the growth of those companies because there is, so I'm in a battery company, and there is huge risk in the battery industry, and I personally think part of it is because we're gonna blow everyone else out of the water. Um, so you don't wanna be just randomly investing in battery companies, but if you were to be in the incubators that, are in, that, that the good ones are in, and then as they take off, you get on the launch pad, you know, as they take off, you go up with them, um, and then one of the things could be Sea Wave battery, and you could really fly. All right. So that's an example of uh, an investment that would be aligned with the world we want to build in. So that's great. Uh, my question to you might be a bit nebulous, um, but I'll do my best to be Kay. precise. I'm really interested in what you're saying about cognitive dissonance and trying to bring ourselves <coughs> into alignment holistically with all of the personal and business decisions that we make. And I also deeply appreciate the way you describe the extent to which we're inextricably linked and we're, our project is to de-link from things that are destructive or otherwise counter to our values. And one of my deep concerns is with big data and the information industry. And for example, if I send you an email, you know, that a lot of that data, whether captured by bot, it, the fact that it's captured by Gmail's bot or whatever is irrelevant. The data is still captured personal profiles are being constructed, um, our personhood is being traded, so it's a kind of information slavery, I would argue, and it's premised on a false construct of consent, which is obtained solely through adhesion contracts, and a lot of legal scholars will um, are of the view that this is extraordinarily destructive to personhood and to the kind of privacy that's required for democracy and human flourishing. All right, so that's a big topic. Um, I've heard uh, very recently a story of this uh, PhD student in law from Austria who won a uh, watershed lawsuit on privacy with Facebook. Uh, and this will probably lead to the United States having to adopt much stricter privacy laws for personal data in compliance with what's happening in Europe. So I think that would be the first step. I mean, to a certain extent, uh, here in this country, for convenience, <laughs> we have given up all our data. It's like. Do you own your movie now? All right, so yes, you're not gonna read, you know. Did, did you see um, uh, sp term and condition apply? It's like this documentary yeah, exactly. on all this, you know, uh, all we agree to with like accept every time we click something, you know, like a contract. Nobody reads that stuff. So much so that one company had for a while a paragraph said that you would agree to sell your soul to the devil. And you know, everybody say, yeah, agree, agree. So, uh, but it's interesting, you know, and the, the effect of that is this new industry that collects data and whether it's used by uh, the National Security Administration or just by corporations trying to sell you something. Right. It's it's big deal. And I would say it's interesting, this development now, this, this guy who um, uh, requested all the data that existed 
about him on Facebook and found that they were keeping stuff that he had deleted and so sued them. And uh, it, uh, it's coming that stricter regulation will come to this country most likely for, for the, this corporate companies like Facebook to operate in, in Europe. I understand that, and I, I appreciate that. And the thrust of my question, well, and let me also toss out that now attorneys at EFF are working on, I, what is it called, a, they want a global privacy. Um, covenant. Okay. Covenant something, yeah, and lawyers at EFF are working on that. But my question to you is, are you aware of companies that are working to help people like myself who want to extract ourselves from this destructive industry? Uh, since you're doing law, you're a lawyer, right? I would say uh, environmental, uh, the um, Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund is doing the strong possible work uh, in the legal area that I know of. So check Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. Kind of a, a, I think, quick question. Um, around this peer-to-peer -peer lending stuff, your thoughts on things like Lenders Club or uh, Prosper? Yeah, so uh, that's, uh, you know, it's a way of these intermediating bank lending and credit card lending. Uh, so I think it's, uh, it's good. It's one of the options that we have. Um, yeah, and so um, uh, both Prosper and Lending Club, if you have a diversified portfolio, you can get a decent return, and you select the people that are, uh, you know, you're lending money to. Most of them are trying to get out of the credit card uh, debt, and credit cards have very high interest, so by refinancing through those uh, lending platforms, they could usually get a lower interest or have a fixed period over which they will extinguish their debt. So I see that as a viable investment opportunity for people that want to do direct investing. And, um, you know, so, yeah, I like that. Hi, really briefly, and thanks again so much for sharing all your knowledge. I am probably not the only person that has uh, the mutual funds that are this package of nebulous things and 3 to 5% is with Chevron or something, or other oil companies. How do I approach that? Would I run away from the whole package because it's it's not separatable? Or is there another better way? Because I want to move away completely from fossil fuels and other things, and I don't really know how to do that. Got it. Uh, now, the good news is that the fossil fuel thing is becoming now big enough so that a number of companies are offering fossil fuel-free mutual funds. So if that is your concern, that's a, a good way to do it. I mean, there is, uh, I don't know if the Domini fund, is the uh, Domini uh, uh, fossil fuel-free, maybe? Anyhow, there are now a number of options that are being created to mimic the funds similar to the one you have, but removing all the fossil fuel companies. So you can, you can check with your advisor about that, if you have one. All right. Oh. Any other questions? Well, Marco, uh, our theme for the month here is vocation, and I think you have truly found yours. All right. <laughs> um, and I think everyone in the room does. How about a little appreciation?